Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. I'm a real light sleeper, child. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Shoot the Moon, released February 19th, 1982. It was written by Bo Goldman, directed by Alan Parker, and released by MGM slash United Artists. Screenwriter Bo Goldman began working on his first screenplay, originally titled Switching, way back in 1971. It was inspired by his own observations of acquaintances in toxic marriages and the traumas they were unknowingly inflicting on their children. He did laps around Hollywood pitching it everywhere until the success of Star Wars gave 20th Century Fox financial leeway to take chances on less commercially driven projects. Fox president Alan Ladd Jr. passed along Goldman's script to director Alan Parker, and fresh off the set of fame, the men collaborated on a rewrite. Shifting the story from New York to San Francisco and retitling the project Shoot the Moon. Alan Marshall was attached to produce, and the film would become the fourth of seven collaborations for Alan's Marshall and Parker after Bugsy Malone, Midnight Express, and Fame, and preceding Pink Floyd's The Wall later this season, Birdie, and Angel Heart. I feel like one of these is not like the other. Yeah, a <laughs> little bit. It is interesting, though, that they're both coming out in 82 for The Wall and this. Yeah, exactly. If the if the title used to be Switching and now the title is Shoot the Moon, I feel like they're trying to, and maybe we talk about this at the end, put blame on everyone in this. Maybe. I actually like the title Shoot the Moon based on my interpretation of what it means, but we'll get to that when the words come up in the right. story. Right, yeah, because okay. I, I, I did not know that term. Yeah. I do. We'll talk about it because I, I actually have a lot of issues with it. But now switching, in my mind, can mean a couple different things. Yes. One, it's these couples are trading partners mm. in a way that we've seen previously in the 1980s in Shirley MacLaine films. and uh, <laughs> But also switching meaning like hitting with a switch. Yeah, like I was just about to say, if you should strike your child yeah, with a coat hanger. Like being oh. abusive to your children at the same time as you're trading partners. Mm. Fox dropped Shoot the Moon from their slate in the wake of Ladd Jr.'s firing in 1979, and the project landed with David Begelman, who agreed to distribute through MGM with Parker directing and Diane Keaton starring. An earlier offer was put out to Meryl Streep, who turned it down because she was pregnant. But Keaton was attached soon after the project locked at MGM. She has said that her recent breakup with director-slash-co-star Warren Beatty during the production of Reds heavily influenced her performance here. On the way to Albert Finney for the George role, it was offered only to Jack Nicholson, who turned it down, but he and Keaton were co-starring at the time in Warren Beatty's Reds. With the exception of the eldest, Dana Hill, the daughters of the story were all first-time film actresses, and Karen Allen was cast as Sandy on the strength of her turn in Raiders last year. The film would have released in awards season of 81, but Keaton's contract for Reds strictly forbid the release of any competing titles in the same calendar year. What? Wow. She could only be in one movie in 1981. And I checked her IMDb. Reds was the only movie that she was in in 1981. That's kind of a heavy-handed contract. In fact, that was her first movie since Manhattan, so it had been a couple years even. They begged Beatty to change the contract or to ignore it, and he's like, nope, not going to do it. Huh. Shoot the Moon was instead given a platform release in several major cities on the way to a wide release in February where it failed to recoup its $12 million budget. It was, however, nominated for a pair of Golden Globes for stars Finney and Keaton, but no wins. We open on a farmhouse at sunset. There's a crowded duck pond, a station wagon in the driveway, a bike lying on its side, and a set of dolls mid-tea party in the yard. This house is actually the Roy Ranch House, a 114-year-old home that was chopped into four parts and reassembled at this location over the course of the film's six-week pre-production period. They moved the whole house? It had been abandoned, so it wasn't where they needed it because there was shit around it so yeah. they moved it into this valley to shoot this and they made a fake driveway and it looks great it's a really cute house it's i beautiful. like the house a lot but i guess that makes sense that they needed a house that they wasn't occupied do anything yeah. they wanted to yeah. it inside we're introduced to the father of this story george dunlap played by albert finney he holds his head as if hung over coming down the stairs he's wearing a dress shirt with a bow tie undone 
He walks into his home office and sits at his desk for a quick cry. Just something dads do when nobody's around. <laughs> yeah, of course, having watched this whole movie, I'm just like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Whatever>. right? <laughs> the entire scene plays out under the chatter of his daughters and wife elsewhere in the house. The wife's voice is being recognizably provided by Miss Diane Keaton playing Faith Dunlap. The talking between his daughters and wife gets louder and louder as they begin arguing with each other. Dad picks up a phone on his desk to call someone. He tells whoever he calls that at the ceremony he's headed to tonight, he'll be thinking of her the whole time. It's clear this is a mistress of some sort. Why would you call from Because he wants to get caught. That's why. Is that is that yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I could not think of a reason unless you had like a private line running He cares so little at this point that he's like, I'm not even going to cover my tracks. If they find out, then it's like huge relief for me. But he, so he's crying moments before this. A boo hoo hoo. You're cheating on your wife who's in the other room about to escort you to an award ceremony who's being supportive of you. Yeah. Like this is just so incredibly obnoxious. But it's perfectly fitting with the character that we learn that he is over the course of this story. Upstairs, his eldest daughter, Sherry, played by Dana Hill, discreetly picks up a phone to listen in on the conversation. She doesn't hear anything directly incriminating, but it's clear he's speaking with someone he cares about, and the voice tells George he shouldn't be calling from home. It's clear already, though, that the mistress's voice belongs to actress Karen Allen. The girls are all crowded around their mother's vanity, trying on too much makeup and accusing each other of looking like hookers. Do I look like a hooker? No, you look beautiful. You don't look anything like a hooker. See, I don't look anything like a hooker. What's a hooker? As George heads upstairs to finish getting ready, Sherry passes him on her way down and lets it slip that she was paying attention to his phone call. You off the phone? What? I asked you if you were off the phone. Yeah, I was just talking to Jim. Jim, huh? Is that why you whispered? When George finally meets up with his wife, Faith, he compliments her dress and she worries it still has a wine stain on it from last year's ceremony. Wine? The wine that you spilled when Peter Marks went instead of you. You always remember the wrong things. Yeah, I don't Sherry is babysitting her three sisters while George and Faith head off to the awards show. I hate that line from him. What? You remember the wrong things? Yeah. That just means think what I want you to think and remember the things that I did good and don't remember the things that I did bad. Oh, God. Yeah. Like, I just... Well, let's... Hold on. He hasn't done enough yet for okay. us to hate him so much. I'm sorry. I'm so angry at this man that everything we have that seen the whole movie. comes yeah. out of his mouth is just yeah. infuriating. The kids are not allowed to stay up and watch the local broadcast because they have school in the morning. After some hounding from the kids, Faith gives in and gives them permission to stay up. George and Faith drive to the city of San Francisco to attend the awards show. George is clearly not a fan of the city and complains about every aspect as he encounters it. Faith sits quietly, wanting the night to be over. This city could die from quaint. That was a joke. Not funny, huh? I'd forgotten you'd stop laughing. Going for the standard failed comedian fallback of, is this thing on? In the lobby of San Francisco's Fairmont Hotel, George Dunlap shakes hands with his agent Willard and a publicist named Scott Gruber in the lobby. Gruber is hoping to give this literary awards show a bit of Oscar flair and instructs George to please return to the curb outside and re-enter the lobby by way of strutting down the red carpet for photographers. George is understandably reluctant. Evidently, George doesn't make many public appearances because photographers mistake his wife for a friend. Or maybe he makes public appearances with someone else yeah. that they assumed was his wife. A banner on the wall inside informs us this is the 25th International Book Awards. Back at home, the Dunlap kids are all staying up late to watch the show in their parents' bed. Mrs. Dunlap takes a seat at the table beside another plus one at the event, and right away the woman asks about her family and then proves herself to be yet another vapid, tactless person. When am I going to get to see these wonderful children? Well, I, I actually I have some pictures no, here. No, no, don't bother, darling. I, I can just imagine how fabulous they are. When is nonfiction anyway? Implying that not only is she a generally fake person, but she's already in a hurry to leave. Back at home, the kids all shush each other as the announcer takes the podium to present the winner in their father's category. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. May I have the envelope, please? Oh, 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 shh, 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 shh. Be quiet, be quiet. <laughs> and the winner is... The court game, George yeah! Dunlap! <laughs> the kids are excited to see their father speak on television and explode into cheers when he mentions them in his acceptance speech. George also mentions Faith, 
and the camera pans to find her in the audience. Again, the children whoop and holler to see their parents celebrated so publicly. George makes his way back to their table and offers his wife the briefest kiss for the sake of nearby cameras. As soon as the cameras leave the table, a bored and annoyed look reclaims her face. She too is ready to go home. The drive home is silent except for the score, and Faith turns occasionally to face her husband in the driver's seat with a sort of shocked look of disgust. Presumably they come home to find their daughter sleeping in their bed because we see them transferring the unconscious kids to their own rooms. In the middle of the night, George is setting up a bed in the spare room when Sherry finds him and asks why they aren't sleeping in the same bed together tonight. He comes up with some excuse about injuring his back and not wanting to wake her, but Sherry has deduced that they are fighting again. Aren't you even going to congratulate me? Congratulations. We see more inserts of Faith moping around the house and staring forlornly out the windows at the morning light. Because everyone stayed up so late, the kids barely make it to the school bus on time the next morning. Faith has to run panicked after them to hand off Marianne's worm medicine to her older sister, Sherry. What? Wor wor did you say worm medicine? That's yeah, what she says. that's what she says. Yeah. But I also feel like they put so much on this oldest child mm -hmm. yep. in terms of caring. She does more than, than the mom does in this story. For everyone. Story. Everyone in this story, including her parents. Yeah. It's so frustrating. Back inside, Faith enters the kitchen to find her husband rifling angrily through all the drawers in search of something. He seems to have misplaced his glasses and complains that he can never find anything anymore because he suspects the children are constantly fucking with his stuff. But he's looking for them in the most ridiculous of places. It's like, maybe maybe my glasses are in this silverware drawer. It's like, I've learned what? to look the weirdest places <laughs> for things. It makes sense. Maybe it's in this butter drawer. We have a whole drawer for butter. We have a butter, butter drawer? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's what I've been using it for anyway. <laughs> no wonder things end up in weird places. <laughs> Can't find my glasses. I think they sunk into this butter drawer. <laughs> when Faith pushes back against his angry search, he reminds her that without his glasses, he can't write and they can't afford their lives. Don't work, don't earn money. That way we can all stop. Don't be starving, George. Oh, yeah. In the fridge, George is upset again to find they are out of orange juice, and Faith admits she intended to buy some on the way home last night. Well, two in the morning. Two in the morning has been perfectly fine for you lately. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the night before last, George. I was in town. I was working. You were with your lady friend. She makes it clear she's aware of his romantic indulgences, and for an award-winning writer, he's very slow to come up with an excuse. Lady friend, what kind of a word's that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't deny it. Yeah. Are those even words? It's like you're fucking, only you don't tell anyone about it. That's what it is. George decides the best course of action to win this argument is to admit everything and shut her down by describing his indiscretions in great detail. When she explains that, no, she doesn't want to have this conversation, he argues they should, and their words get louder and louder until they're taking turns destroying every dish in their kitchen. In the awkward silence that follows, she kneels to collect the shards and be the bigger man, and George threatens to pack a bag and leave when she confesses that she already packed him a bag. And I really wanted this comment to end with, your glasses are in it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. George collects his packed bag and leaves under the quiet sobbing of his wife. We dissolve forward some time, and we see Sherry has predictably taken up some of the parenting responsibilities of the house, or maybe all of them. <laughs> She is simultaneously scheduling a doctor's appointment for a sibling while preparing breakfast for all four of them before they leave for school today. She keeps accidentally burning toast and eventually her sisters show up to admit they don't even want breakfast. What do you mean you don't want any breakfast? God damn it, you! Oh, oh God damn it, I'm fixing all that breakfast and nobody eats it! I'm tired of it! The struggle is real. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always really frustrated when I'm like, God damn it, I took these four bags of gummies out of the cabinet. I'm not going to have to put them all back. Well, that was gonna... breakfast, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm going to eat one of them. <laughs> I'm going to eat all four of them in the goddamn bags. God damn it. What? Faith doesn't even make it out of bed before the kids leave for school, and they seem vaguely disappointed in her. The bus pulls up, but George is also parked at the end of the driveway. Jill, Marianne, and Molly hop in Dad's car, but Sherry opts to take the bus. After a moment on the bus, she cries into her hands. The kids try to make plans this weekend with their father, but he informs them he's arranging a road trip for everybody to tour author Jack London's home. Every kid's dream mm -hmm. trip. <laughs> Jack London's house? Sweet. Oh, it's not a house? It's, it's, it's the rubble of a burned yeah, down house? It's rubble. <laughs> Very cool, Dad. I can't wait. That's the best rubble I've seen all day. <laughs> rubble, rubble. Hamburg, look at the fuck out of here. <laughs> Is that lady 
Sandy gonna come? Sandy? I don't know why. Just wondering. George and the girls sing Hippopotamus for Christmas as they continue driving to a diner to grab some hot chocolates on the way to school. But as soon as they're served, Molly accidentally knocks them all over across the counter, staining all their clothes. Well, she knocks one over, but then all the Just kids are like, pushing it like everything. everyone keeps fumbling, going, whoops, oh, there goes the next one. Yeah. They arrive late for school, and George writes them a note from a pad of paper hanging from his rearview mirror. Apparently, this is a common enough occurrence to necessitate that. Mm-hmm. I, well, I re- he's a writer, though. Maybe he just has to jot down ideas all yeah. the time. Like, the kids were late for school again <laughs> on a dark and stormy Genius. night. Genius. I, I, I really want the note to have just said, the kids are late. It's okay. George, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, teacher, it's okay. George sits back and catches his breath as the girls disappear into the school. Jesus. How does she do it? Meaning, I presume, faith. And the answer is probably, don't make unnecessary stops on the way to school if you're already running late. <laughs> but also the answer this morning was, just let Sherry do all the work. Yeah. During the school day, George camps out in a beach house to write, but gets little accomplished, needlessly poking his pencils into an electric sharpener over and over. Yeah, he's got a typewriter, but he keeps sharpening pencils. I'm like, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing? In case I need to cross things off after I fuck them up. Also, this house is uncomfortably close it's right on to the, the shoreline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean... And this is Sandy's place, right? Uh, I think this is his beach house. Sa- Sandy has another place that's like uh, uh, more of an apartment. Kind oh, okay. Of. Maybe it, that's It's, it's also close to the water. I think that makes sense because later Sherry goes there and I don't think Sherry would know where it was if it wasn't her dad's. Well, she's been to Sandy's place too. But we'll, we'll get there. You know, obviously I've been to the Pacific Northwest. I know people build homes really close to the water, but man, that surf is just coming right up to that house. Yeah. He wanders the beach for a bit, and we hard cut to the girls back at home watching Wizard of Oz with Faith. Yeah, he wanders the beach, and he sits down, and it's like like sad, depressing. He's like, no, no. Don't care about don't, this guy. Don't care. I mean, I don't doubt that he's suffering from depression on top of all the mm-hmm. shitty stuff that he's doing, but it's like I don't, I don't think we're meant to sympathize with him in this situation. That night, we see George pulling up the road to the house with a police car close behind him. When Faith greets him at the door, he says he's here to collect his personal books. Apparently, his lawyer suggested bringing a cop in case things got messy, but Faith has prepared the books in advance for him to collect. She tells the kids to go brush their teeth and prepare for bed, and George collects the boxes of books to take to his car. George comes back in for another load of books, and suddenly they're joking about bad dates from their past. When George starts outright flirting, Faith has to pump the brakes a bit. Do you recall the last <laughs> movie that we had bad dates in with Karen Allen? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's good. Sorry. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> right on cue, the phone rings, and it's someone named Jerry they both know, and she seems excited to speak with him. Naturally, they punctuate the phone call with an argument, and George proves the policeman necessary by getting predictably angry about his wife moving on with her life. We cut to George and the kids on a beach. This is the third or fourth scene without Sherry because she's been deliberately avoiding her father. Right off the beach, they ring a doorbell on a beach house and Karen Allen answers the door, inviting the girls inside. This is Sandy, their father's girlfriend and former mistress. She's clearly doing her best to impress the girls with lemonade and cookies prepared. We cut back to the farmhouse and Faith is smoking a joint in the tub. She sings the Beatles' If I Fell quietly to herself. If I give To you, I must be sure from the very start that you would love me more than her. She's set to sobbing by the words when the phone rings. It's her mom. She has to fill her parents in on their divorce progress and then quickly gets off the phone. The next day, we see a pickup truck dragging a tractor out to the farmhouse. The driver hops out, and it's Peter Weller playing a handyman we'll come to know as Frank Henderson. He picks up a stuffed animal to play with on the porch while he waits for the homeowner to appear. He informs Faith that he's here to construct a tennis court on the property, evidently planned long enough ago that Faith had nearly forgotten they were even coming. Uh, uh, It's hard to, to figure how much time has elapsed. I think this is more just a lot of stuff has happened in the last week, and she totally wrote over it in her okay in so, her memory banks but the but the the construction or the planned construction of the tennis court is after the separation right yes, yes. Okay. 
Well, yeah, because she she wouldn't want to do it while he still lived there because George didn't want one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. Like, I was trying to figure out how much time. It seems like she's been, most of what we've seen her has been in bed and depressed. Right, yeah. And then at, at, at some point she apparently ordered a tennis court to be constructed. It seemed I, kind I, of odd. I thought this was something they had discussed before they broke up because he seems familiar with it when she mentions well, something about a tennis court. But maybe it's I think something they disagreed on. I was going to say, I think she's wanted it for a long time. And I think but she, she committed to it after she hasn't left. been getting it because mm-hmm. he was around. And now okay. that he's gone, she probably in some frenzied state of just like, I know I'm going to make myself feel better. I'm going right. to have tennis court. Because she seems surprised by the need to pay and not having the money to pay for it. Right. Uh, you don't want the tennis court no more? Well, yes, I want the court. I've wanted that court for five years. Five years, a long time to wait, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear already from the energy between these two that they're at least attracted to each other. She was expected to put 1000 down today, but they turn down another job to collect it, and Faith says she doesn't have it on hand. Frank confesses to knowing her name and situation, insinuating she definitely has the money, being that her husband is a famous author, and she counters with an offhand mention of her recent divorce, suggesting that her money might conceivably be tied up at the moment, but also, less overtly, that she is newly single and perhaps ready to mingle. She offers her word that she can afford the work, but understands if that's not good enough, and apologizes for wasting their time today. He pauses in the yard to ask where she was planning on putting the court and then reluctantly agrees to the deferred payment, clearly hoping to score a date with his efforts. Frank's partner in the truck is less excited to hear they're working on spec today. Her husband left her. I see. Besides, I like her. Her or her ass? I didn't notice her ass. We cut away to the historic home of Jack London, and George tells the three cooperative kids the story of the property. The night before Jack London was to move into this house, somebody set fire to it. Who set fire to it? I don't know. Could have been one of the workmen. Could have been somebody jealous. He's a very great author. Sounds to me like his ex-wife did it then. (laughs) Sounds to me like he did it. (laughs) Yeah. The kids read from the pamphlet about London's first marriage and seem annoyed that so much of the tour deals with his second marriage and ignores the whole first family. A clear shot at Sandy, who seems to be playing the part of the author's second wife in their live-action reboot of the story. They stare at a flat, mossy rock in a garden and talk about how somehow this rock is all that's left of the author who died relatively young at 40. Finney himself would have been in his early 40s during production, but I'd buy (laughs) mid-50s. Yeah. George's daughters take turns assuring him that London was, in fact, great, and it's clear they are all simultaneously endorsing their father. Jack London was a wonderful man. You bet he was, Dad. He was a wonderful man. Yeah, he was a wonderful man. That night at bedtime, Sandy offers to tuck in the girls. They try to prod her with questions to make her uncomfortable, and their efforts backfire miserably. (laughs) I bet you want to make love to Daddy. Yes, I do. What's wrong with that? What's it like making love to Daddy? Making love to your Daddy is a rare and beautiful thing. Get into bed, Mary. Good night. Night. But what's it really like? What's it really like? It's like eating ice cream. Okay, holy shit. That's way more graphic than I was asking. (laughs) You're painting a vivid and horrifying picture for me now. The girls are merely amused by the ice cream answer. Where do the sprinkles go? (laughs) Oh, God. It's like eating ice cream. (laughs) I think it's disgusting. (laughs) We cut to George, Sandy, and the three girls singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat on the way to dropping off Sandy at her beach house. George takes the girls to Carl's Jr. on his way back to Mom's place. The kids argue over what and how much they're allowed to order each until George just goes into the dining room to improvise an order on his own. We cut to the handoff as Faith greets the kids at the car in the pouring rain. After the kids disappear into the house, George tells Faith that he has a gift for Sherry's upcoming birthday and tickets to the ice capades, but Sherry already told him she's not interested. George asks Faith to please persuade her, and it's clear Sherry's dad boycott is having the desired effect on him. When Faith hears about the actual gift, a typewriter, she has to admit that Sherry would love it. Before he goes, George confesses he might have accidentally taken some of her books with his own the other night, a classic narcissist move looking for reasons to come back and see her, doing something that might be confused for a favor if it weren't so carefully orchestrated. Faith doesn't want whatever books he accidentally took and introduces him to Frank when he emerges from the doorway. As Frank walks through the rain out to his own vehicle, Faith explains he's here to build the tennis court, 
and, clearly inspired by jealousy, George pretends to have a problem with the tennis court and not the man. Faith gently reminds him that this is no longer his house and she can put whatever she wants on her property. Well, you're not at this house anymore, George. Remember, you walked out feet first or maybe there was something else preceding you. Which is a bit of a clunky line, but I think it's meant to imply that George was led out of the house by an erection for his mistress. Yeah. But their divorce isn't finalized. They haven't split up their marital assets. Yeah, he still so, technically owns at least half of this house, probably. Yeah, they're at least both on there if not i mean i don't know what their agreement was though and they've already been to some court right at this point that doesn't yeah but i think that they were discussing custody yeah not they, they weren't settling yeah. their their property because that would happen as a part of the divorce not right. as a part of the separation faith closes the front door stranding george in the rain he looks up to an attic window and gives a quick wave to sherry looking down on him she backs away from the window without waving back Sometime later, the rain has let up, and Frank is working on clearing the yard for the tennis court. Sherry sits with him on the tractor, and he lets her steer while her sisters try to clear the tractor's path of large rocks. Not that I was hoping for it, but there's a lot of shots of this child-operated tractor getting uncomfortably close to some of the other daughters, and even a dog, but thankfully nothing traumatic happens here. I was certain somebody was going to yeah. die in this movie. <laughs> Sherry is even left alone at the controls a few times. Don't put it in here, though. The girls wrench back and forth on random levers, lifting and lowering the tractor's blade. During a break in the work, Faith suggests expanding the scope of the project by adding a gazebo at the edge of the court for summer picnics with the family. He agrees it would be a beautiful addition, and Faith rises to get them some beers. In the kitchen with Sherry, she admits she'd like Frank to stay for dinner. Why don't you ask him? No, I think you should ask him, Sherry. He likes you. You think so? Uh-huh. Yeah, I do. So why don't you ask him? Oh, I don't know. Oh, ask him yourself. Come on, Sherry. Okay, I'll ask him on one condition. Yeah. That I get to eat dinner with you guys and none of the other kids get to come. Why? Okay, it's a deal. How is that going to work? <laughs> yeah. Like, you only feed three people and the others just go to bed? Or you all go out to eat and just leave the three kids at home alone? It's a weird request yeah. anyways. What is she after? Unclear. It's It's almost like she wants to make sure that her mom doesn't do anything. I don't know. I think she wants this relationship to work out with Frank. It's, it's unclear. Faith is immediately panicking about what to make for the meal, and Molly tries to calm her down. Hey, relax, will you, Mom? He's only a guy. <sighs> toward the end of the meal, Faith starts rushing Sherry off toward bed, and she doesn't appreciate it. Faith offers Frank a cigarette for dessert, and they take a seat in the den. She puts on Rolling Stone's Play With Fire. Frank inspects the trophy on the coffee table in the shape of a golden quill and inkwell, Probably the one we saw George win earlier. Yeah, it's, it's funny that he just left his award. Yeah, he does not give a shit about it. It's like when uh, Frank Cross leaves his humanitarian yeah, award exactly. in the taxi. I'll cherish this. And all of you. Frank asks her to dance and then to kiss, and she turns both offers down out of apparent anxiety about how quickly things are moving. She changes her answer on the kiss, and they're quickly making out on the couch together. He stupidly starts unbuttoning her shirt in the common room of a house with three sleeping children. <laughs> What are you doing, guys? We cut forward to the middle of the night at Sandy's place, and George is awoken by Sandy's thus far unseen son, Timmy. I was so confused. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Which bedroom it, are we in? Yeah. I thought it was one of his kids yeah. until it was the, It was clear that it was, it was a it's like, male child. Did he say Timmy? Yeah. Who is Timmy? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what is happening? Sandy's thus far unseen son, Timmy, having a coughing fit. Sandy starts to climb out of bed, but George assures her he can handle it. He gives the kid some coke to calm his throat, but the kid is on the verge of vomiting, so George takes him to the restroom. Coca-Cola, to be clear. Yeah, he doesn't <laughs> cut him a line on the pillow. It was the 80s. But it was also warm. Like, the kid's like, oh, it's warm. It's like, it's good for your stomach. Better drink it. Warm, drink it. <laughs> Timmy is still confused why George is here in the middle of the night. <laughs> and giving him Coca-Cola for a cough. Where did you find this hot soda? It's like really hot. It's <laughs> literally steaming out of the bottle. You're sleeping over? Yeah, of course I am. Don't you want to go home and be with your own children? Once he gets Timmy back to bed, he returns to Sandy's room. She admits that Timmy's father, Sean, never got up to help their son in the night like that. She speaks very kindly of their relationship and even admits to loving George here. But then, right at the end of the paragraph, she reminds him that even though they've had nothing but good times together, she's been hurt before and he is replaceable. I feel like George is not the guy that gets up for his own children. No, though. he doesn't. No. He's doing it to impress her. He's not doing it because he cares. Yeah. I like you. 
I love you. And if you don't come through, I'll find somebody else. We cut back to the farmhouse where Faith is trying to vacuum the house and Sherry is arguing with her that her chest hurts and she needs to go to the hospital, but Faith doesn't believe her for whatever reason. Sherry calms down and admits for the first time out loud that she hates her father. Why did Daddy leave us? Well, I don't think he left you. I think he left me. She explains further that divorce is nobody's fault and that people sometimes grow apart and there's nothing either of them can do about it. Sherry asks about her wishes for the future, and Faith shares George's thoughts on wishes. Wishes are sometimes all that we have. Whatever that means. I don't get it. It's just like, don't wish stuff. It's important to wish stuff, but don't wish stuff, because then you just wish stuff. Also, he left all of them. Right. If, I mean, he's he's sharing custody right now. Yeah, but but if, if she trying to get sole custody, he would fight it. But if he decided, I'm going to move to New York and never see you guys right, ever yeah. again... She would not fight that. She would not fight that. No. And then he would just go, well, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Bye, kids. We cut forward in time to Faith shopping with all the girls when they happen to cross paths with Sandy in public. When Sandy disappears again, the kids hit Faith with a barrage of questions about what she thinks of the other woman, and Faith is so angry she can't engage in the conversation. Back at the farmhouse, George comes flying up the driveway and finds Faith and Frank flirting beside the tractor in the backyard tennis court site. George has to honk his horn to get Faith's attention. He asks where Sherry is, and she explains she went into the city with her grandmother. George is obviously annoyed because he's here with her birthday typewriter, but Faith never promised him time with her today. He follows Faith into the house and watches her making Frank a sandwich for lunch. George says he'll come back to deliver the gift in person later. On his way out, he warns her that Frank's paving the court all wrong, and he won't pay a penny for it, but Faith never asked him to. He nearly leaves it at that, but his growing fury forces him to address Frank directly before he goes. Hey, buddy! It looks like shit! You could not play horseshoes on that volcano! What? Oh, just ignore him. Don't pay any attention to him. But what the hell is he saying? I said fuck you! <laughs> what an odd choice of, like, a volcano. It's like, that's how uneven it is? Yeah. It's literally just a pyramid up to the middle. And then flat, and then a crater in the yeah. center? I don't, I don't I, what do you, what do you <laughs> say? Molten lava inside of it? <laughs> I think you're thinking a little too hard about this, Richard. <laughs> it's called a metaphor. George skids back off down the driveway, and Faith wanders embarrassed away from Frank. Sometime later, George returns to the house. He parks at the start of the driveway this time, right next to a pothole, and steps out into a puddle. At the door, he demands to see Sherry, and Faith reminds him that Sherry has been clear as possible about not wanting to see him. I want to give my child her birthday present. Your child doesn't want her birthday present! The disagreement escalates wildly out of control, and Faith has to slam the door in his face, at which point George begins kicking the hell out of it, and then smashes his gift through the window to reach through and unlock the door. He attacks Faith and throws her back out the front door onto the porch before jamming a chair under the doorknobs. Then... He turns to charge up the stairs at Sherry. Sherry locks him out of her bedroom, but he busts down the door and throws her across the bed to swat her over and over again, first with his giant Albert Finney hands and eventually a clothes hanger. <laughs> I don't want to laugh at that. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to inject some levity here where I can. <laughs> Do you guys recall the last time we saw a shitty parent abuse their child with a clothes hanger? Mm. Mommy dearest? That's right. No! At the front door, Faith struggles to coach Molly to unwedge the chair from the door handles. Sherry's other sisters bust into the room to pull their father off of Sherry, and Sherry rises with scissors in her hands, ready to defend herself from another attack. George finally breaks down to apologize, but they just plead with him over and over to leave. He follows Sherry back out to the staircase and begs her forgiveness. Faith finally gets back inside and rushes to hug her daughter and order George out of the house. On the way, he collects the typewriter from the floor and then runs full speed into the night. And now you get on the phone, you call the police. The police, yes. yes. And, and or your lawyer right. to, who would advise you to, to call, call the, the police. police. Yeah. To fi so not just file a report. Go find a camera. Take yeah. pictures of literally all, all the of damage. this damage yeah. that he just did. Take pictures your of your child. Your daughter is bleeding probably. Yeah, take pictures of the injuries. We jump now to a local courthouse where Faith is understandably attempting to make changes to their custody agreement. Not understandably, George's attorney points out that Faith never filed a police report and accuses her of fabricating the birthday attack. Why in God's name would you not file a police report? This man will kill your children someday and you're going to let him because 
Aw, he loves us. I don't mean to victim blame here, but why even bother bringing him to court if you're going to literally tank your own case by never filing the report? My only guess would be that she expects George will just admit to the wrongdoing and surrender custody here, even though he has not been a big remorse shower thus far, and the fact that he's even alive to attend this hearing proves that. Couldn't she bring the children in to testify, though? Mm, I mean, I suppose you could do that, but... The defense could accuse her of coaching them in some testimony. Faith is awarded the kids for Christmas break, and after court is adjourned, her attorney asks permission to go after George and his girlfriend, but Faith forbids him from protecting her children from this raging psychopath. Faith and George cross paths on their way out of the courthouse, and she gives him permission to collect the kids early this afternoon because she's headed out of town to visit her ailing father in the hospital. George is sorry to hear his father-in-law is sick and offers to visit as well, but Faith assures him it isn't necessary. Infuriatingly, he shows up to interrupt her last moments with her father anyway, no doubt hoping to score points here. He lies to her father that they're back together, but he's not buying it. Well, they both. they. Yeah, yeah but he like, puts her up to it. He's yeah. the one who says, yes, we are back together. And he's like, is this true? And she has to go along with it because otherwise they just lied to him. Cut it out. You two are a couple of lousy little liars. You're right. You're broken up, Dad. <sighs> yeah. Give me, Daddy. Not a chance. Her dad asks to speak with George for a moment, and Faith steps outside. In private, his words don't make a lot of sense, and George realizes he's dying right now, and argues with the man to fight it and survive. So, I didn't realize until after I had looked up into the cast that this character's name is French. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and and he kept saying French. <laughs> and I was like, what, do why are you, you want, saying that? Why do you keep saying like do you want him to speak French? <laughs> is that why this guy keeps <laughs> is that why the guy in the bed keeps squinting? It's a French steward. Oh. You died on me for Christ's sake. I need you. <laughs> and even though her dad seems moved by the comment, it reads intentionally or otherwise, like George was hoping to use his illness to get his wife back. The nurses take over and send George out of the room, and we cut right to Faith's father's funeral. French's funeral. From the makers of French's mustard. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming he's American. That would yeah. make him Franco-American? Perfect. George tries to ride in the same car with the immediate family for the funeral procession, but Faith's mother turns him away. Do you want me to ride with you and Faith in the car? There's no room. No room or no place. No place. Yes. Yeah. But hold on. Hold on here. She finally says it. (laughs) What follows within the scene is scripted and framed so confusingly that I honestly can't tell what's even happening here. Immediately after mom says no, Faith says. Maybe he can squeeze in with us, mother. Yeah, it's okay. I'll ride with Uncle Ned. Suit yourself. Which, what? She literally just said no and mom looks resigned and says, fine. Suit yourself. Then we see Faith and her mother, Charlotte, get into the car, and then the door closes behind them. But when it closes, the car door completely exits frame, so we can see no part of the car now. And the whole scene plays out in a single shot. So Faith said, fuck you, mom, he can ride with us anyway. Nobody in the world matters except my shitty abusive ex-husband. And then they got in the car and closed the door behind them. Then George turns to Sherry and says, I forgot to get a flower. Do you want to go get a flower with me? And she says, no, Dad, I don't want to go get a flower with you. So but She's also holding his hand. Yeah. And I was like, "Why? what is happening? But so Charlotte already didn't want him in the car. And then Faith said, he's coming anyway. And you just stood out here while they closed the door. And now you're going to walk away to collect a flower and make them sit here and wait for you in the car? Sherry says, no, I'm not going to go get a flower. And then... A driver opens a car door back into frame and George gets inside, but because the car was completely out of frame for like eight to 10 seconds, I have no idea if he got in the same car or if the other car pulled away and he got in the next car. If it's the same car, why did they uninvite, reinvite, and then close the door before him? And if it's the second car, why did it sound like Faith invited him along and Charlotte said, fine, if he didn't get in the car? (laughs) I don't know what happened here. I expected a confirmation in the following shot with him either riding with them or not riding with them, but instead we hard cut to him in a rowboat in the middle of a lake for the image that will become the film's poster and cover art. He sits alone in thought on the still water for a moment, and we cut from the rowboat to a restaurant. This scene is insufferable. 
it's a very strange because I don't know were they meant to meet or nope. were they just they just happened to be going. He didn't to even know she was still in town. She he thought she was staying with her mom. And it turns out she got a hotel in the city. I mean, I'm guessing that this is a place that they would frequent they like together. If they're around, yeah. George is eating alone, and a woman sitting at the piano in the corner is warbling unlistenably. Faith enters the same restaurant, and the staff try to seat her with George, not realizing they've separated and aren't here together. She asks for a different table, but George finds her there anyway. Very quickly, they erupt into another loud argument, and the people seated around this insufferable couple beg them to shut up, but they don't. At first, George accuses her of throwing him out when he left willingly and suggested it first. She, for some reason, has to remind him that he was cheating on her and a terrible husband. In response, George argues that she was wonderful and perfect and he was a piece of shit for their whole marriage, which is not quite grasping how arguments are supposed to work. Like, (laughs) you're supposed to speak in defense of yourself against me. Eventually, Faith is driven from the table and he follows her around the restaurant shouting full volume, even picking a physical fight with another customer, then suddenly, Faith switches sides to join George in a fight against this other couple. Yeah, it's like like the wife of the other couple goes, hey, give him a chance to Faith. Yeah, and then and she flips the lady off and they're yeah. like, you don't flip off my wife. And yeah. suddenly everybody's fighting. Mm-hmm. But this couple had a legitimate grievance. They were shouting and now they're shoving these people around out of nowhere. But they, but they also got involved. Right. Like, I will say this. The, wi- the wife I- involved herself. Right, yeah. Insanely, the restaurant staff walk Faith and George back to their own table instead of kicking them out and offer to reward their disruption and assault of customers <laughs> with free alcohol. Can I get you a little brandy on the house? Two doubles. Mrs. Dunlop, would you like to order now? Yeah, I want a lobster. One pound or two? Three. Okay. <laughs> so, so three ones or a one and a two? <laughs> one three pounder, please. Go back there and find the monster. George and Faith are grinning at each other like maniacs, and this is as clearly as the film puts it that they are, in fact, both monsters and fully deserve each other. Their children, however, should be relocated. I think we won. They head back to the hotel where Faith is staying in town, and George forces his way inside over her objections. But they're both drunk, and eventually she gives in. We jump forward to Faith's post-coital realization she can't believe what she's done here. George pretends not to understand what's wrong, or maybe he's actually that sociopathic that he doesn't realize how awful this is. Faith panics as she realizes everything is going back to normal. She's letting him back into her life, but he will still have Sandy and nothing will have changed. She confesses to having loved him once and addresses for the first and only time in the film their age difference and hints at him having groomed her in the past. Right? The actors are 10 years apart, which sounds exactly like something this character would do. It does. I would like they, they gloss over this. Yeah. They just kind of throw it out there, and they don't come back to it. I'm like, did they just talk about how he groomed her and right. she liked it? Yep. You made me feel loved when I was a girl. You helped me grow into a woman. Which also makes sense, considering Dana Hill playing their oldest daughter is only 18 years younger than Keaton. Speaking of Sherry, she busts in on them right now because apparently Faith brought the girls on this trip for her father's funeral booked adjoining hotel rooms, and then just left them here at the hotel to get drunk with her ex-husband? Is that what happened tonight? Yeah, and, yes. and didn't lock the doors. Right. But she didn't intend to go get drunk with her. She was just going to dinner by herself, leaving her children in a hotel. But yeah, and it's not like she was picking up food to return to the hotel to feed her family. She was literally going to go and sit down at a table by herself and have a whole meal. Molly threw up her eclair. Right, I'll be right there, Sherry. I think you better go, George. Sherry is obviously upset to find her mother in bed with George, and I'm surprised George didn't say, what's the problem? I'll take care of that eclair problem. I'll go clean it up myself. (laughs) Get her another eclair. (laughs) These four eclairs are so hot, Dad. (laughs) Shoving them in her mouth. (laughs) We cut back to the farmhouse and a party underway on the newly completed tennis court. Strings of lights are hung along the court's fence. Molly and Marianne play tennis in the center of the court, and we cut to Frank manning the barbecue with Sherry beside him. She invites him to dance. Frank tries to pawn her off on the other young men here at the party, but eventually agrees to dance after another minute of cooking the steaks. Faith sneaks up behind him and asks to dance, and Frank doesn't hesitate to abandon the steaks, leaving Sherry in charge of them. This is where a human person would have said, I just promised Sherry a dance, Yeah. so I'll get you next, but we suddenly need to start hating Frank quickly because the movie is almost (laughs) over. Yeah. 
Share. Also, also, I was very um, displeased with the choice of using just exposed chain link to enclose the tennis court yeah, instead that was of weird. the like the netted. plastic coated yeah. or yeah. or yeah, something some, like a netting would have been better, or at least like at that green rubber coated chain link fence because it's the Pacific Northwest. It's yeah, like, it just looks it's like a junk wet right and now. damp. Yeah. Sherry looks on the verge of tears as she cooks the steaks alone. Sometime later, Sherry sits watching them dance, and Frank invites Sherry to join them. As the three of them sway together, Sherry asks about Frank's hefty overnight bag and hints that it looks like he's moving in, but Faith doesn't want to talk about it. Now, wait a minute, Sherry. I'm not moving in, so don't go jumping any conclusions. Am I jumping? What do you mean, Sherry? <laughs> you fucked Daddy last week and you fucked Frank this week. Who are you going to fuck next week? That's enough. Ow. Ow. Faith slaps Sherry hard across the face, and Sherry outruns her mother, disappearing into the tree line at the edge of the property. We cut to Sandy's beach house where George, Sandy, and Timmy are playing board games, but I guess this is his beach house. Yeah, I think this is yeah. his beach house. And it's house. apparently within walking distance of mm-hmm. the right? other house. Yeah. Like, I'm surprised you can't hear him ranting and raving it from his own house at night. But they're playing board games inside, or I guess they're playing hearts. They're playing hearts, yeah. George hears a sound outside and spots Sherry walking to sit at the end of the dock. He picks up her typewriter gift and joins her there. She opens the case and admits to loving the gift. Nothing, nothing like a for a good typewriter like exposed saltwater surf. Yes. <laughs> Not to mention that he used this to bash open the front door earlier. I'm sure right? there's a bunch of loose keys just <laughs> sliding around in the box. Shards of glass from the door. Blood. Human <laughs> blood. <laughs> typewriter blood. That's just ink. Red, red ink. What is this? That's door blood. I killed a door with this. She criticizes her father for cheating on Sandy with her mother because she's the only consistent character in this film. George is annoyed to be called out for his bullshit and tries to walk away from her, but then returns to apologize again. You're always sorry. I just don't want to get zapped with a hanger again. She asks who he loves more, Sandy or Mom, Timmy or her. He tells her they were just playing hearts inside. Did you hit the moon? No, I did. You lied. He shot it twice. This is the moment from which the film gets its title, and it's admittedly a clever metaphor since shooting the moon is a strategy in the game of hearts wherein you can win the game by intentionally doing everything wrong, which seems to be George's strategy in the personal game of hearts, which is his marriage. He's doing everything wrong and for some reason gets everything he wants. Yeah. I don't think that that's... I, I don't think that's the point that they were going for. I don't think that's the point that they were going for. And I, I was trying to make that leap the entire time we're watching this film. I'm like, okay, where where are we connecting the shoot the moon yeah, playing to, against to the their actions? Playing against standard strategy. I, don't, I think that they make the wife too disagreeable by the end. Like, we don't like her either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the the fact that she's smiling so much in that one restaurant scene really pissed me off. Like, I got weirdly angry that she was, like, super in love with him after that argument with the strangers. Sherry begs her father to just admit he loves her mom, and he doesn't think it will do any good. He drives her back to the party and hangs out to observe the finished tennis court, admitting that it looks good. Faith invites him to bring Sandy here for a game of tennis sometime, but he's distracted from her words by his own internal calculus, racking his brain for a path to save his marriage before it's too late. Then it finally occurs to him. He admits he loves Faith, and he's not ready to lose her. He'll do whatever it takes to prove he's serious. He will leave Sandy, and he will make up for as much of the damage he's done as he can. Or, (laughs) (laughs) option B, he says he really must be going. He wanders back to his car, puts it in gear, and then crashes full speed through several parked cars and a direct path to the tennis court. And his children. Right. As well as corners of the house. And other people's children and other (laughs) adults all over the place. This is a crowded tennis court party. He bashes with a fence and closing them all in. Yeah, there is nowhere for them to run. (laughs) He bashes a small hatchback through the fence around the court, demolishes several picnic tables, rips down the net and the entire gazebo with his car, while Frank pounds helplessly against the side of it with a discarded chair. Partygoers dive for their lives, and George finally buries his station wagon in the debris of a once lovely gazebo. And Frank starts tearing slats of wood off the car to get at George inside. He drags George out of the car and beats the fuck out of him in the middle of the court. 
Faith and the girls beg Frank to stop, but this man almost just killed people because he's an insane man-child loser yeah. who can't deal with his wife moving on. And it's 17 love. <laughs> That's what they should have called this. <laughs> 17 love. When Frank realizes exactly how stupid George's entire family is, he drops the bloodied and bruised old man in the middle of the tennis court and cuts his losses, walking away from the whole mess. Faith and the girls rush to George's side, and he reaches up for them and for their forgiveness. Hey. We freeze frame on the disturbingly simian silhouette of Finney's hand reaching for his wife, and it's clear he's won his family back. He can probably even keep fucking Sandy if he wants. The end. Oh, what an infuriating Ugh. ending to this movie. The one redeeming thing for me is that I was worried right up until this last scene that we were still supposed to want them to get back together. Mm. But I think it's pretty clear that the point is not that. Yeah. That he just tried to kill everybody. He's a complete maniac and these people are awful and they're hurting their children. But but his kids like huddling towards him and that, cradling that's, him. They're Ugh. they're victims in this whole situation. They they've they've been told to love this man and care for him no matter what he does to to love him unconditionally for his entire life. And and their mom has been putting up with so much for so long that they've learned it. And uh, I don't blame them for thinking this is what you're supposed to do when mm. someone's hurting you. The the fact that going back and reading that it was inspired by this guy saw what his friend's shitty marriages were doing to their kids and that that's what inspired this script made me realize the point is not that you want these people to get back together or that it's like, oh, they're just crazy in love and that's just how it's supposed to be. The point is... This is terrible. These two people are terrible to each other and they're poor kids and that's sad. And that's fine. That is a fine way to go with this movie. They did it wrong. Mm -hmm. They needed to make Sherry our main character who never liked her parents in, in, by the end. Like we needed to have somebody- Someone who, who is who seeing is, it through our eyes. Who is redeemed and, 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 and says exactly what we as an audience are thinking. It's just like, no, you don't deserve your children. You don't deserve our love. But I do think for most of the movie that she's, she's doing what she's supposed to do, which is rejecting her father and saying, I'm not going to be a part of this disagreement but, that you guys have. Yeah, but there's a couple of other things too, like- I mean, I, I get when they first separate and she's depressed, but the fact that she just won't even get out of bed and forcing Sherry to like service the house and take take the kids to school, essentially. Yeah. I was like, okay, I, I understand that you're depressed and this is a- It reminded me of that, but, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Song of the North or something like that with Ellen Burstyn when one of her kids dies. And then in the wake of her kid dying, we see her oldest kid is like doing everything and she never gets out of bed. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it? Is that called Song of the North? Season of the North? Time of the North? I forget. It's with her and Tom Skerritt where they keep moving further and further. Yeah. North. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and and then, yeah, the stuff that happens later with, with it's like, oh, you know, we, we had a fun little argument and it reminded me of why we love each other because we have arguments. Yeah. I really love these arguments we have. Like, I don't know what it was about the interaction with that other couple that suddenly turned her around. Unless it's literally just adrenaline. And they're both mm. adrenaline junkies. Yeah. And when they start physically fighting with each other, suddenly they get like a, a high out of it and they appreciate that high and mistake it for affection. But it's gross and terrifying every time it happens. I think that's why both of them are breaking plates in the kitchen well, instead of just one of them exactly. doing it. Exactly. I agree with that. And I also think it was the woman, like the woman and the man at the dinner, like interfering. And so. You know, this suddenly they, f they felt united. like they were in the right. Yeah, they yeah they they suddenly felt united and like she was going to defend her husband. And I think that that goes back to you know whatever grooming has happened. Right. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Because when we see her dad in the hospital, her dad does not look that much older than Albert Finney. Mm -mm. <laughs> like they could be brothers easily. That relationship didn't get fleshed out enough either because they seemed like just weirdly close. Like they were like work colleagues or like something where yeah. it's just like it seemed oh, like they had like you, a connection on we were best level. friends and then you married my daughter yeah <laughs> chinatown style yeah what are we thinking on this uh thumbs up thumbs down oh it's a thumbs down yeah it's a thumbs down i again revisiting like the first half of this movie just in discussion was like i don't care about you 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 caused this you caused all of this albert finney yeah I, I think it's still a thumbs up for me because even though I hate these people, like I think they're mostly well written. The only scene that really bothers me is the restaurant scene. And I think it's just something I don't get about 
the way that these types of personalities would interact with each other. But the rest of the story, I feel like they're fairly consistent, awful people, and they're at least well-written. And the dialogue is smart and snappy. And I like the way all the kids are written, too. They feel very lifelike. I know a lot of them weren't didn't have a lot of acting yeah. experience before this so that's why it's a very naturalistic performance they, from them. they probably just let the kids kind of do their thing yeah except for uh dana hill but even that can be hard to get what you want from the kids to do like a naturalistic thing and to have them use the correct names and spill things believably and stuff like that so i think i think the cast was pretty great what are we thinking letterboxd i have it at 24 out of 27 it is below mcvicker <laughs> But above Death Wish 2, Oof. because at least this one didn't have any rape scenes. Uh, uh, didn't it? <laughs> I have it at uh, 23, uh, and I have it below One from the Heart and above Personal Best. So it's like right snug in there in the middle between like yeah. two other frustrating yes. movies. I have it in 18th, which is just under The Seduction and just above Death Wish 2 also. Because at least The Seduction had, uh, what's her name, who I really like. Why am I blanking on her name? Colleen Camp. Colleen Camp. Yeah, Colleen Camp makes it all better. (laughs) Our director here was Alan Parker. Before this, he directed Bugsy Malone, Midnight Express, and so far on the show Fame. Later this season, he directs Pink Floyd's The Wall, and later Angel Heart, Mississippi Burning, The Road to Wellville, Evita, Angela's Ashes, and The Life of David Gale. Are we watching The Wall? Yeah. Okay, cool. For this year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it has a lot of storytelling elements. Yeah, yeah. It's not just music. The writer here was Bo Goldman. When it was still titled Switching in the early 70s, this unproduced screenplay so impressed director Milos Forman that he hired Goldman to adapt Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, for which Goldman would win an Oscar in 1975. Man, so this script was around for a while. Yeah, I mean, I think he had a draft in 72, and then um, it was just bouncing around for a long time. Goldman also previously wrote the scripts for The Rose, and so far on the show, Melvin and Howard. After this, he writes Scent of a Woman and Meet Joe Black. The cinematographer here was Michael Sarazen. He previously lit Bugsy Malone, Midnight Express, and so far on the show, Foxes, Fame, and Tattoo. Later, he lights Angel Road, Rambo 3, Mercury Rising, Angela's Ashes, The Life of David Gale, Prisoner of Azkaban, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes, Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle, and Gunpowder Milkshake. The editor here was Jerry Hambling. He also cut Bugsy Malone, Midnight Express, and Fame. After this, he cuts Pink Floyd's The Wall, Angel Heart, Leonard Part 6, Mississippi Burning, In the Name of the Father, The Road to Wellville, White Squall, Evita, Angela's Ashes, and The Life of David Gale. Albert Finney played George Dunlap. Before this, he was Tom Jones in Tom Jones. He was Scrooge in Scrooge. He was Hercule Poirot in Murder on the Orient Express. And so far on the show, we've seen him in Wolfen and Looker. He's back this season as Daddy Warbucks in John Huston's Annie. After this, he's Kilgore Trout in Breakfast of Champions. Ed Masery, or Ed Masery, I don't know how to pronounce this last name, and Aaron Brockovich. He's the chief of staff in Traffic, Ed Bloom in Big Fish, and roles in Ocean's 12, The Corpse Bride, Born Ultimatum, and Born Legacy. His last credit was as Kincaid in Skyfall, a role which I think was first offered to Sean Connery. It must have yeah. been. And he was like, you could not pay me any amount of money to do this. Diane Keaton played Faith Dunlap. Before this, she was in The Godfather, played again Sam, Godfather 2, Love and Death, Annie Hall, Interiors, and Manhattan. We've seen her so far on the show for Sleeper and Reds. After this, she's in Baby Boom, Godfather 3, Father of the Bride, Manhattan Murder Mystery, Look Who's Talking Now, First Wives Club, The Other Sister, Something's Gotta Give, Finding Dory, and of course, as Bieber's grandmother and the music video for his song Ghost. Karen Allen played Sandy. Before this, she was in Animal House and The Wanderers. We've seen her so far in Cruising, A Small Circle of Friends, and Raiders. Later this season, she's back for Split Image. After this season, she appears in Starman. She's Claire and Scrooged, and she has returned to the role of Marion for Indiana Jones sequels Crystal Skull and Dial of Destiny. Peter Weller played Frank Henderson. He's LaFors in Butch and Sundance The Early Days. We've seen him so far on the show for Just Tell Me What You Want, and later he's in Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, but he's definitely best known for his many appearances as RoboCop. He's also in Leviathan, Naked Lunch, and he was Marcus in Star Trek Into Darkness, which I think I have a credit in too. He has also returned to Old Detroit to voice RoboCop in the 2023 first-person shooter RoboCop Rogue City. Dana Hill played Sherry Dunlap. She's most recognizable as Audrey in National Lampoon's European Vacation. She has lots of voice acting on shows like Pound Puppies, New Yogi Bear Show, Mighty Mouse The New Adventures, 
Jetsons the movie, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures, The Adventures of the Gummy Bears. She's Jerry in Tom and Jerry the movie. She's in Rover Dangerfield. She's Tank Muddlefoot on Darkwing Duck. Mm -hmm. Foster Fenwick on the OG TMNT. She was Max Goof on Goof Troop yeah. for the TV series. Badoobity bop, bobby doo bop. She's in Bonkers, Rugrats, Bobby's World. She's Charles, half of the two-headed offspring of Private Detective Duckman. And, of course, we've also mentioned recently, I forget if it was on the air or not, that she sadly passed away quite young. She was 32 years old, and she had a stroke after complications from diabetes. Vivica Davis played Jill Dunlap. This is her first film credit. Later, she's Polly Maxwell in V. And beyond that, she's in Curly Sue, a Seinfeld episode, PCU, Message in a Bottle, Ed TV, and Castaway. Tracy Gold played Marianne Dunlap. This is her first film role. She was Carol Seaver in 166 episodes of Growing Pains. Tina Yothers played Molly Dunlap. This is her first film, and she's best known as Jennifer from 172 episodes of Family Ties. George Murdoch played French DeVoe. I guess that's the father-in-law. Mm -hmm. Before this, he did lots of television and disaster movie Earthquake. He was also Dr. Salick or Salick in five episodes of Battlestar Galactica. We've seen him now in Any Which Way You Can, and speaking of those films, he's back this season as Quaid in The Sword and the Sorcerer. Because Quaid is the name of one of the characters in the Any Which Way You Can movies. He's also the voice of God in Star Trek V The Final Frontier, and he's credited as Elder Number 2 in four X-Files episodes. Leora Dana played Charlotte DeVoe, that's the mother-in-law. She was Mrs. Alice Evans in 310 to Yuma. She was Mrs. Kramer in Tora Tora Tora. She's back next season as Emily Caswell in Amityville 3D, and later as Joyce in Nothing Lasts Forever. Irving Metzman played Howard Katz. We've seen him now in Stardust Memories. I think he was playing Woody Allen's attorney, so that's probably where he was recommended mm. to play Diane Keaton's attorney. He's also in Fort Apache the Bronx, Arthur, and So Fine. He's back this season for Annie, and later War Games, Purple Rose of Cairo, The Money Pit, and Crocodile Dundee. Kenneth Kimmons played the maitre d' that bribed them with alcohol to start more fights. He was in Network. After this, he shows up in Cheers. He's in Bachelor Party, Invaders from Mars. He's likely best known in the role of Howard Burley, or Burley, on Coach, or as Dr. Klein in 15 episodes of Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Most recently, he appeared as the Commodore in Confess Fletch. Michael Aldridge played Officer Knudsen. He was Sheriff Blake in The Incredible Melting Man. He's back this season in The Entity and later in The Sting 2, Scarface, Iron Eagle, and Johnny B. Good. Robert Costanzo played Leo Spinelli. That was George's attorney. He previously appeared in Dog Day Afternoon, The Goodbye Girl. We've seen him so far in Saturday Night Fever and Fatso. After this, he's in The Star Chamber, Up the Creek, Total Recall, Dick Tracy, Die Hard 2, City Slickers, North, and Forget Paris. David Landsberg played Scott Gruber. We saw him last in Loose Shoes, and he also has a writing credit on one Star Trek TNG, The Outrageous Okona. Oh, well. <laughs> Luke Utel played Willard. Before this, he was in Little Big Man, Young Frankenstein, Foul Play, and so far on the show for Minnesota The Black Marble, and later he's in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. James Crana played Harold. Before this, he's in THX 1138, American Graffiti, Sunshine Boys, Time After Time. We saw him last in Die Laughing. He's Whittle in the Ewok Adventure and Tebow in Star Wars Ewoks. He's also in Tucker, The Man in His Dream and Mrs. Doubtfire. Nancy Fish played Joanne. Before this, she was in Freebie and the Bean and More American Graffiti. On the show, we've seen her in Cardiac Arrest and An Eye for an Eye. After this, she's in Sudden Impact, Howard the Duck, Cutting Class, Troop Beverly Hills, Exorcist 3, Death Becomes Her, but I always think first of Mrs. Peenman in The Mask. That's his landlady with the, mm. the green stuff on her face. Jeremy Schoenberg played Timmy. He's the voice of Linus Von Pelt in most Charlie Brown movies and specials. That's the kid that, uh, oh, wow. the Karen Allen's son in this movie. Aesop Aquarian played Rick. Before this, he's in A Star is Born and Big Wednesday. We've seen him now in Galaxina, and he also appeared in John Benjamin Has a Van, Iron Man 3, which I think I also have a credit in, and the recent Ballad of Buster Scruggs. I think the last time he came up, we also mentioned how close he came to getting roped into the Manson family's famous killing spree, but their philosophy started freaking him out, and he left like two days before everything boiled yeah. over. He's got a very uh, Manson family-sounding name. Yeah, Aesop Aquarian. Jim Lang played MC. He was a popular game show host known best for the dating game. Most of his credits are as himself, Jim the MC, or as here, simply MC, including on Bewitched, Laverne and Shirley before this, and later Amazing Stories, Parker Lewis Can't Lose, Moesha, 
the Charlie Kaufman penned Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, the story of alleged secret agent Chuck Barris. Well, and that that makes sense. Because he composed the dating game theme song, so it features largely in the show. George Ann Johnson played Isabel. She has lots of TV work before this. We've seen her on the show in From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. She's also in Health and Looker. And then it's back to mostly television, including as the mother of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman on that series and those TV movies. Or maybe one TV movie, I don't know. Olan Jones played Counter Girl. We saw her last as a judge in Die Laughing, probably at the Battle of the Bands. And later, she's in The Right Stuff. She's Esmeralda in Edward Scissorhands, and she shows up in Beethoven, Natural Born Killers, X-Files, Mars Attacks, The Truman Show, and she's the mother of Garrett Landry on Community. Hector Morales played Mexican Man. We saw him last as a general in Herbie Goes Bananas, and he's back this season in Losing It. Later, he's Carlos in Three Amigos. Morgan Upton played Photographer. He played a stormtrooper in episode four. We've seen him in Loose Shoes, Cardiac Arrest, Die Laughing, and Choo Choo and the Philly Flash. Later, he's in The Survivors, Sudden Impact, Peggy Sue Got Married, and Tucker, The Man in His Dream. Edwina Moore played Reporter. This is her first credit, and she must have been a real reporter because she has credits as Reporter and Anchorwoman all the way through The Negotiator in 1998. Fran Ryan played Judge, uncredited. We saw her last in Stripes as the cab customer that Bill Murray stranded on the bridge in Kentucky. (laughs) She also does a couple voices on Rescue Rangers and Tiny Toon Adventures. I think that's everything for Shoot the Moon. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't believe it helps visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast for access to all our monthly 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. For August of 1974, our $5 patrons are choosing between the following 12 titles, 99 and 44 100% dead. John Frankenheimer's action comedy, which takes its name from an old slogan for ivory soap, but which I know best from a reference in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It tells the story of a hitman roped into a gang war that escalates out of control when the hitman's girlfriend is taken hostage. It stars Richard Harris, Edmund O'Brien, Bradford Dillman, Chuck Connors, and Ann Turkle. Amazing Grace, Stan Lathan's Mom's Mabley comedy vehicle about an elderly Baltimore woman who plans to sabotage her dim-witted neighbor's electoral aspirations when she learns they're being puppeteered by greedy politicians. It stars Moms Mabley, Slappy White, Rosalind Cash, and Moses Gunn. The Black Godfather, John Evans' exploitation crime saga about a young man's efforts to consolidate power over a citywide crime syndicate and facing off against powerful heroin cartels. It stars Rod Perry, Damu King, Don Chastain, and Diane Summerfield. Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, Sam Peckinpah's action crime drama about an alcoholic pianist and a prostitute traveling to Mexico to collect the bounty on a dead gigolo. It stars Warren Oates, Isela Vega, and Robert Weber. California Split, Robert Altman's comedy drama about an amateur gambler following a professional gambler in a downward spiral of debt and addiction. It stars George Segal, Elliot Gould, Anne Prentice, and Gwen Wells. The Castaway Cowboy, Vincent McAvity's Walt Disney Western comedy about a Texas rancher who jumps ship in the Pacific and washes up on the island of Hawaii, where he helps the locals to save their failing farms by teaching them effective cattle ranching techniques. It stars James Garner, Vera Miles, Eric Shea, and Robert Culp. Confessions of a Police Captain, Damiano Damiani's Italian crime drama about the clashings of a cynical police captain and an idealistic DA on the hunt together for a mafia boss. It stars Franco Nero, Martin Balsam, Mary Lou Tolo, and Claudio Gora. Dead of Night, Bob Clark's horror drama about a Vietnam vet whose return from war coincides with a string of unsolved murders, and after some time, his family is informed that he was killed in action. It stars John Marley, Lynn Carlin, Robert Backus, and Henderson Forsyth. The Girl from Petrovka, Robert Ellis Miller's comedy drama about an American journalist in the Soviet Union who meets and falls for an undocumented ballet dancer, unfortunately bringing her to the attention of Soviet authorities. It stars Goldie Hawn, Hal Holbrook, and Anthony Hopkins. Harry and Tonto, a Paul Mazursky comedy about a man and his cat on a cross-country road trip. It stars Art Carney, Herbert Berghoff, Philip Bruns, and Ellen Burstyn. Macon County Line, Richard Compton's successful independent film about a Georgia sheriff on a war path for the drifters that murdered his wife. It stars Alan Vint, Jesse Vint, Cheryl Waters, and Max Bayer Jr. And Newman's Law, 
Richard T. Heffron's American crime film about an L.A. cop relieved of duty by false charges of extortion who continues investigating his caseload off the clock to circumvent potential corruption in his own department. It stars George Pappard, Roger Robinson, Eugene Roche, and Gordon Pinsent, each of which will be celebrating their 50th anniversaries in the month of August. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Swamp Thing, which IMDb describes like so. After a violent incident with a special chemical, a research scientist is turned into a swamp plant monster. We leave you now with the trailer for Swamp Thing. Government agents, scientists, soldiers, master criminals, secret formulas. Monsters and midgets. None of them belong in this swamp. Only one thing does. The Swamp Thing. Uh-huh. Here comes trouble. The Swamp Thing. There goes the neighborhood. Adrian Barbeau and The Swamp Thing, an outrageous pair in the incredible adventure that grows on you or all over you. The Adventures of The Swamp Thing. The comic book legend lives.